Thanks to a law passed earlier this year, the state's trying a new way to put the brakes on the rising cost of health care. But a new report from the Pioneer Institute reaffirms the argument for a different approach, one that concentrates more control and, yes, even more rationing in the hands of the consumer. We'd like to welcome is our guest from the Institute, the Director of Healthcare Policy, Josh Archambault. Thank you very much for being with us, Josh. Thanks, Chris, for having me. This is called consumer-driven uh, healthcare. So what does that mean exactly? Well, consumer-driven healthcare is really a catch-all phrase for the demand side of the way that you try to control healthcare. Typically, consumer-driven health plans involve some sort of deductible and something called a health savings account or a health reimbursement account. Now, when uh, there's talk of a health savings account, uh, one of the things that people have to figure out, at least the way I've had it described to me, is that uh, you set aside some money, but uh, what if you end up not using it all within a certain amount of time? Uh, could you lose it? Yeah. So the, this was one of the reasons we decided to put out the report. There's actually a number of different consumer tools that are out there. So a health savings account is a little bit like a credit card. You're able to put money into it. Your employer can put it into it. An employee can put it into it. It's tax-free. You own it for life, whether you leave your job or not, you keep it, and it rolls over from year to year. Now, the other consumer tools that often are um, misunderstood as being like a health savings account, something called a, a flexible spending account. Now, that's where an employer, I'm sorry, an employee decides at the beginning of the year, I want to set aside this amount of money, and if you don't use it by the end of December of that year, you could lose it. Now, the third kind or category of consumer tools is this health reimbursement account. This is from the employer side. They decide to put an extra amount of money, again, tax advantaged aside for you, and if you uh, spend all of your health savings account money or if they want to help you with your co-pays or co-insurance out-of-pocket costs you can tap into that it's just an employer commitment to help you with some of your costs now we usually hear this approach described as one in which the consumer knows more about how much they're spending for their care how does that really shape up what's the main difference between that and HMOs let's say yeah, so for us, the typical way that we do it in Massachusetts is we're really concerned about how much are we going to have to pay when we show up to the hospital, form of a copay or coinsurance. So it may be $10 or $30 or even $100 if you go to the emergency room. That's really what we're concerned about. But the theory here for these accounts are that you do, for the routine amount of care, want to shop around. And as we know, and it's been in the popular press, that here in Boston, we have examples where the same procedure of the same quality will cost $5,000 somewhere and $2,000 somewhere else. So through these consumer tools, you want to engage those folks to find that $2,000 routine care and save themselves and the system in general a lot of money in the process. And I guess with the, the more prevalent models in Massachusetts, the ability of the consumer to look outside a certain realm and, and say, no, I'm going to go there this time, that is kind of restricted. That's right. We, we, depending on what product you're in, you may be only able to go to certain kinds of hospitals. But you do hit on a very good point, which is for these products to work, you need a lot more information on both price and quality. And we're moving in that direction. We have something called a all payers claims database, which is every single person that's paying for health care reports their data on how much it costs to the state. And the hope is eventually consumers will have access to the data. You'll be able to pull out your app and say, all right, I need an MRI. Where's the best quality, cheapest one around me? And it will pop up and you'll be able to make your appointment on your iPhone and, and speed up that process. But that's the sort of information that we need. And we realize that we're not quite there yet, but we need to move in that direction. It, it's been said, uh uh, that one of the disadvantages of, of a lot of price consciousness for consumers is that they might uh, put off things that they really need to have done. That's right. And this has been a concern for many years with th these so-called consumer-driven health plans. Now, what's very interesting about them is that even before the federal law passed, they actually made preventative care free. So they were ahead of the curve on this front to make sure that people didn't put off the routine stuff that they need to be getting. Now, when you get into things like uh, MRIs or x-rays, that's when you want a consumer to be able to go out and shop for the best quality. The current system that we have now allows high cost, low quality care to remain lucrative. We don't know that it's not a good value until afterwards, where we really upfront want to know where that best deal, best bang for our buck is. What about states that have used this approach, at least uh, more than we have around here? Yeah, so as far as New England is concerned, Massachusetts lags behind all other New England states for having health savings account. That's just one way for us to monitor how engaged consumers are. For instance, uh, the state of Vermont has close to 20% of their population using these sorts of tools. And nationally, we've seen a huge increase in their use. I think 14, about 14 million people this past year are using health savings accounts. 
we're far behind. And while we do lag the rest of New England, and it's not a silver bullet for containing healthcare costs, it certainly could play a really meaningful role in helping to bend that cost curve that we hear so much about. I think there are states, is it maybe Indiana that has used this a lot? Yeah, that's right. So we do have a few examples in which states have used it for their government employees. So in Indiana, in 2006, they passed a law which offered it as an option for their state employees. Since then, they now have 90% of their state workers in these plans. And a 2010 study looked at how much money did they save and are people happy with the plans. They saved over 10% annually every year. The state last year saved over $25 million, and the enrollees saved 7 to $8 million themselves. So there's real savings here. But I, I will just pause and say there's actually more than just savings. There's actually something called a health dividend which is as soon as folks move to these sorts of plans, you see them more engaged in their health. They are more likely to use a health tool, try to uh, quit smoking, to lose weight, than those on traditional plans. And there's a variety of reasons why that is. But I think that's really important because we know 70% of healthcare costs are related to lifestyle choices. And as a result, we need to have these sorts of tools to help people live healthier lives. Thank you very much for being with us. Thanks. Josh Archambault from the Pioneer Institute.